Yeah, so uh, I'm going to be talking about conservation properties for the rotating shallow water equations. Um, and what that really means, and what I'm kind of going to focus on, is structure preserving discretization of the rotating shallow water equations. So as we'll see, sort of all fluid dynamical systems have this very special Hamiltonian structure. And an easy and powerful way to get conservation properties is to discretize the equations in such a way that that Hamiltonian structure is respected. So uh, before we get going, uh, just a brief introduction to who I am, kind of a broad overview of what I do research on. So I'm a PhD student in atmospheric science at Colorado State. Um, work for Dave Randall at the Center for Multiscale Modeling of Atmospheric Processes, also known as CMAP. Um, and I did my undergraduate work at Carnegie Mellon. So what do I do? Um, the main thing that I work on are uh, discrete models of the atmosphere. And in our field, these are known as dynamical cores. And they're basically what you would get if you took all of the water out of the atmosphere and just let dry air move around. And in that particular subfield, what I'm interested in are numerical methods that preserve this uh, special Hamiltonian structure. Um, and sort of connected with that, I'm also interested in what are called mimetic methods. And that's going to be, for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, discrete exterior calculus. So I'm not going to go into either of those in a whole lot of depth. I'm going to try to keep this talk at a high level and sort of uh, focus on the general concepts. So kind of ultimately, the holy grail of atmospheric modeling is to be able to do simulations like this. So this is a photo from the NICAM group out in Japan. And on the left here, we have a simulation, um, sort of a high resolution global simulation of a couple days of weather. And on the right here, we have the same sort of uh, the same day and observations from satellite. And as we can see, qualitatively, these look incredibly similar. Um, and the disadvantage of this uh, simulation, it was done a couple years ago. But uh, this simulation took, I think, about a week of compute time for one day of actual uh, simulated time. And ideally, you know, the, the next step is going to be able to push these models so that they can uh, do this sort of simulation in real time. And then the, sort of the holy grail is to be able to push these models to where we can actually do simulations at sort of a global cloud resolving resolution uh, for climate uh, purposes. So being able to run these simulations out for tens of years and even hundreds of years. And really, I would challenge any of you to be able to pick out which of these is the model and which of these is reality. And that's kind of what we're going for uh, in the field. So as I alluded to, the uh, equations of atmospheric dynamics, and really all inviscid fluid dynamics, um, have a very special structure. Like, it's not an arbitrary set of PDEs. It's a set of PDEs, a uh, set of Hamiltonian PDEs. And this structure is important because it really underlies kind of all the important theory that's been developed in atmospheric dynamics over the last 60 years. So things like conservation laws, balanced models, disturbance variance, so pseudo energy and pseudo momentum uh, and available potential energy, and then uh, sort of all of the stability theorems. And so really, when we build a numerical model, it should reflect this Hamiltonian structure. So the, the structure that I'm talking about is the structure of non-canonical infinite dimensional Hamiltonian mechanics. Um, and sort of the governing equation is given here. The evolution of our set of state variables x uh, is given by the product of our symplectic operator j and the uh, functional derivatives of the Hamiltonian functional h. And really, in all cases of practical interest, uh, the Hamiltonian ends up being the total energy of the system. And what makes these dynamics interesting uh, is that they're non-canonical. So in canonical Hamiltonian dynamics can also be written in this form, uh, but the operator j is non-degenerate. Uh, and what makes this sort of unique is that um, for fluid dynamics especially, um, this operator j is degenerate, which means it has a non-trivial null space. Um, and the functions, the functionals that lie in that null space are called casimirs, and they satisfy this equation here. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that the evolution, time evolution of any functional f uh, is just given by this equation. And we can see that uh, because the casimirs lie in the null space of j, their time evolution is 0. So they're going to be additional invariants of the system. And these typically arise when we make a transformation from a canonical system to a non-canonical system. And uh, in fluid dynamics, that would be going from the Lagrangian point of view to the Eulerian point of view. And what we've done when we do that is we've hidden a symmetry. Um, and as we'll see, Symmetries uh, kind of in Hamiltonian mechanics are the basis of where conservation properties come from. So I've talked uh, about kind of the general uh, form of non-canonical Hamiltonian mechanics. Now I'm going to introduce the specific set of equations that we're interested in, uh, which are the vector invariant shallow water equations. So the Earth's atmosphere is fluid, but it's a very sort of very unique and special fluid. If you shrunk the Earth down to the size of an apple, the atmosphere would be thinner than the skin of an apple. Um, so it's a very 
stratified thin fluid um, on a relatively quickly rotating planet. And so um, the shallow water equations, which describe the motion of a sort of a two-dimensional compressible fluid, uh, end up being a pretty good analogy um, for the sort of the large scale behavior of the atmosphere. And this is a shallow water simulation done a couple of years ago. Um, and if you've ever looked at sort of a, at a large scale weather map, uh, you can see that this is very similar to what you'd see at a large scale weather map. So for this reason, uh, the shallow water equations tend to be what, where people start from when they're building numerical models, and it's where we're going to start from. So we can uh, define our system here. The state variables are just going to be the height of the fluid h and then the uh, velocity of the fluid u. And our symplectic operators given here, we have the divergence, we have the gradient, and then we have this term, which is called the nonlinear Coriolis term. And then we have our Hamiltonian here, and that's just going to be the sum of our potential energy and the sum of our kinetic energy. And we can take functional derivatives of that, and we get the Bernoulli function and the mass flux. And then again, because we're dealing with a non-canonical Hamiltonian system, we have this uh, family of, of Casimir invariants, and they're just going to be the fluid height times some function of a quantity called the potential vorticity, which I'll define later. So these uh, sort of all Hamiltonian systems have nice conservation properties. Uh, and the ones that we're interested in are the total energy of the system. And that requires two things in order to get uh, conservation. It requires the anti-symmetry of J and the positive definiteness of the inner product, and therefore the Hamiltonian. Uh, and this is something that's going to carry over to the discrete system. So if we can build a discrete symplectic operator J and a discrete Hamiltonian such that J is anti-symmetric and our discrete Hamiltonian is positive definite, then we automatically get energy conservation. And this is sort of a really powerful tool. Uh, the other type of uh, conserved quantity that we're interested in are the casimirs. And again, these are the functionals uh, such that their functional derivative lies in the null space of J. And the important examples that we're interested in are the mass H, the potential vorticity Q, which is defined here. It's just the ratio of the absolute vorticity to the um, height of the fluid. And then the potential entropy, which is just the second moment of the potential vorticity. And there's a whole other class of conserved quantities. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with Hamiltonian mechanics, um, there's what are called the symmetry invariants that come from Noether's theorem. Um, but those end up, uh, for this system, uh, those are things like the angular momentum and the momentum. And for reasons I'm not going to go into, they end up being less important to conserve than these uh, quantities I'm talking about here. So let's build a discrete model of the system. Uh, we're going to start with uh, defining sort of our discrete state variables. And that's going to be the mass integrated over a cell, denoted by m, and then the wind integrated along a cell edge, denoted by u. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar with discrete exterior calculus, uh, we're going to represent the mass as a two form, and we're going to represent the wind as a dual one form. And this corresponds to a, what's called a C grid staggering, or just a sort of a staggered grid system, where you're predicting your mass variable at cell centers, and you're predicting your velocity variable at cell edges. And so our general formulation looks like this. We have our state vector here. We have our skew symplectic operator J. Uh, which is, and we've got discrete representations of the divergence and the gradient, which are just given by the incidence matrices from discrete exterior calculus. And then we have a discrete representation of the nonlinear Coriolis force. And I've written this uh, in terms of matrices because it makes future manipulations easier. Um, but as you might imagine, sort of any practical scheme, uh, is these matrices are going to be extremely sparse. And then we can uh, go through and we can define our Hamiltonian here, uh, which is just the potential energy and then the kinetic energy. And these are defined with respect to uh, what are called discrete Hodge stars. Uh, and that's what gives us our inner product. And when we go through and we look at uh, the prop, we're basically trying to find uh, what properties these operators have to have in order for there to be discrete conservation. And we're going to do that by making sure that this discrete system mimics these uh, important properties of the continuous system. And then we can go through and we can uh, take functional derivatives of the Hamiltonian to get the discrete Bernoulli function and the discrete mass flux. So let's uh, look at these various conservation properties. Uh, Matt, if you go through and you uh, work out the evolution equation for the mass using this system, you end up with this equation here. Um, and this is nice because it's in what's called flux form. So D2 is a discrete divergence operator. And that means that we're going to have mass conservation, so both local and global conservation of mass by form alone, independent of how f of e ends up being formulated. And you can go through and you can work the same thing out for the potential vorticity. 
uh, and you get the same sort of thing, where D2 is now the discrete curl operator, but again, uh, this is written in flux form. So we're gonna get local and global conservation by form alone, independent of how Q ends up being formulated. Uh, the next thing to think about is discrete energy conservation. And again, going back to the continuous system, we just require two things in order to get energy conservation. We're gonna require that J is anti-symmetric, which just means that the discrete divergence and the discrete gradient are adjoints of each other, and then that the uh, nonlinear Coriolis operator is self-adjoint. And we're also gonna require that our Hamiltonian H is positive definite, which means that our discrete Hodge stars I and H have to be symmetric, positive, definite. And these two things alone uh, are enough to give discrete energy conservation. And uh, what's nice about this is that it works on sort of any grid that you can think of uh, and for a wide variety of schemes. So it'll work on the various planar grids that I've shown here, it'll work on a cube sphere, it'll work on an icosahedral grid, as long as we can find I and H such that H is positive definite and Q such that um, it's self-adjoint, we have discrete energy conservation. So this, so far, this has been fairly easy. Um, and it's sort of, this has been shown before in the literature. What's unique and what's uh, sort of more, much more difficult is to get discrete potential entropy conservation. So as I talked about earlier, potential entropy sort of a, is a casimir, so it's gonna lie in the null space of J. So we'd like to do the same sort of thing in the discrete system. So we can define a discrete potential entropy uh, by first defining uh, discrete vorticity. Just take the, the curl of the wind. You can use that to define a potential vorticity. And uh, the mass that shows up here ends up being a mapping from the mass at cell centers to vertices. And you can do this geometrically, <laughs> shown here. And uh, using these, we can define a discrete potential entropy. We can take functional derivatives of it. And then we go through and we multiply that by our discrete symplectic operator and we see sort of what conditions we have to have on our operators in order to get potential entropy conservation. So we do that, and you get two equations. Uh, the first one is nice, uh, because d2, d1 is sort of automatically equal to zero, and that's a consequence of using these operators from discrete exterior calculus, and it's essentially a, a discrete analog of the fact that the curl of the gradient is zero, or the divergence of a skewed gradient is equal to zero. The second one is much trickier um, because it depends on the form that is chosen for R. Uh, and I'm aware of two schemes that can construct Q such that two is satisfied. Uh, the first one's a 2010 scheme developed by uh, John Thuburn and Todd Ringler. And the second one is actually a very old scheme uh, developed in 1981 by Arakawa and Lamb. Uh, and what's unique about the Arakawa and Lamb scheme is that it also has Q equal to Q transpose. So you get discrete energy conservation. So the, the Trisk scheme, um, here can get either total energy or potential entropy, but it can't get both at the same time. Um, our common lamb can get both at the same time, but it's restricted to logically square orthogonal grids. Um, and what I'm working on and kind of where my research is going is to try and extend the our common lamb scheme to using this equation here um, to non-orthogonal arbitrary polygonal meshes. So, just a quick summary, what have we done? Uh, I've developed this discrete framework that can conserve mass, potential vorticity, total energy, and potential entropy on general non-orthogonal polygonal meshes. Uh, and this framework's nice because it cleanly splits the topological parts, those incidence matrices, and the metrical parts, and you can change one component without changing the others. So to go from, say, like an icosahedral grid to a cubed sphere grid, uh, it turns out that the only thing you have to change is H. You can keep everything else the same, and this is sort of a nice, clean separation. And as I alluded to, getting both total energy and potential entropy conservation together is tricky, um, and then I didn't really talk about this, but this we can talk more offline if you're interested. This framework also has a lot of useful mimetic properties, things like linear stability and no spurious vorticity production, stuff like that. On what's, I think the important takeaway from here isn't necessarily this specific framework, but kind of the general method that was used to derive it. So if you write your system in terms of the Hamiltonian, and then you build your discrete model starting from the Hamiltonian form, and you make sure that it possesses the same sort of properties that the Hamiltonian system has, so your skew symplectic operator is self-adjoint, um, and that your Hamiltonian is symmetric positive definite, that you can kind of automatically get all of these nice conservation properties. And this applies to a wide range of methods. So I've shown it for sort of finite difference methods, but you could do it for finite elements, you could do it for spectral elements, you could do it for finite volume. As long as you can build your operators to satisfy these properties, 
you get discrete conservation, and that's a really powerful tool. So that's uh, kind of all I've got for today. This is kind of the future work that we're working on, um, obviously extending that R column LAM scheme to non-square, non-orthogonal grids, and then uh, developing an analogous framework for the vorticity divergence form of the equations. So I've shown just the vector invariant form, but uh, it'd be nice to extend this to other formulations of the equations. Uh, that's all I've got. Um, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dave Randall, for his support and encouragement. I'd especially like to thank the uh, CSGF program for funding, for really giving me the freedom to pursue these ideas. I'd like to f thank all my uh, fellow CMAP students. So, any questions? <laughs>